Every word of God proves to be true. Be the shield to those who take refuge in Him.
on Sunday night, last Sunday night, and I was preaching about the COVID thing. He wasn't preaching about the COVID thing, but he mentioned the COVID thing. And, and it was beautiful. It was so filled with, with hope, and, and it's just exactly where we need If you missed Sunday night, last Sunday night, watch it on YouTube, because it's a fantastic sermon. It gives you a whole different perspective, and it's, a, it's just filled with hope. I love that. Thank you, George. You're a beautiful man. I don't care what your wife says. You are a beautiful man. <laughs> let's, let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your goodness, your mercy, and your love. We thank you that we have hope in Jesus Christ. He took our sin to the cross. He took our sin. He bore our sin upon himself, and he died in our place. What great love. What great love. Now, because of his death, we can be free. We can be free. 
free to serve him, free to be obedient to him, free to love him. That's fantastic. And now we have eternal life. Now we have the hope. We have the hope of resurrection life. How fantastic. Oh God, may we never be so selfish and so greedy that we won't share that with other people. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. I pray for everybody that's that's suffering right now in our in our community, in our neighborhood. So many people. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, you pour out your spirit upon them and you'd speak to their hearts. You'd stir up their hearts. Oh, Father, I pray that we would be faithful in planting seeds in this community and, and that these people would turn to you through the power of your word, through the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you so much. Thank you for blessing each one of us. Thank you for our families and our situations. Thank you for the troubles that we have in our lives. For we know that those troubles are given to us to make us more, conform us more into the very image of Christ. Beautiful. Thank you. We give you all the praise, honor, and glory. Speak to us now through your word. Help us to know what it is you want to tell us. Holy Spirit, work amongst us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Yeah, so today we're, uh, we're on Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 22. Last time we were together, we, were, we talked about uh, uh, sexual immorality. And uh, today we're, gonna, we're carrying on from that point. Galatians 5, 19 to 22 says, Now the works of the flesh are evident. <coughs> the sexual immorality, that's what we did last time. Impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Paul says something very important here. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. If you think you have eternal life and you're living a life practicing anything like this, if this isn't an exhaustive list, he says, and things like these, don't, don't, don't play the game. Don't, don't go to somebody and say, um, if, what I'm doing, do you think it's wrong? Listen, if you feel in your heart that it's wrong, it's because the Holy Spirit's telling you it's wrong. Don't go and check on it. Don't go and check on it. If you want to check, check the word of God. You know if you're being disobedient to God. You know it. But, but most of my life, 90% of my life, I'm, I'm living in obedience to God. It's just that, it's just that you know, it's a weakness I have. No, don't do that. You will not inherit the kingdom of God. There's no excuse. Paul doesn't give any excuses. There's no excuse. Remember, he's writing this letter to the church in Galatia. This is to church people. Listen, people, I've warned you and I'm warning you again, if you do this, if you do any of these things and more, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. That's pretty, pretty strong words. But the fruit of the Spirit. So that was the fruit of the flesh. Now the fruit of the Spirit, if, you, if you're living by it, you're keeping in step with the Spirit, the Spirit of God is working in you, He's changing you, He's transforming you, you're allowing Him to, then the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. These things will be evident. They'll be evident in your life. People will go look at the love and the patience and the kindness that that person has. They must be a follower of Jesus Christ. But if people are looking at your life and going, look at the jealousy, the envy, the strife. They must be a follower of Satan. Think about that. Yeah, harsh words, really, aren't they? So we started to look at this last time. The works of the flesh are evident. Keep in mind that the flesh refers to your sinful nature. We're all born with a sinful nature. Every one of us. Don't, don't kid yourself and think that children are born innocent. I've even heard people make excuses. You know, 
I don't understand everything about God. I never pretend to understand everything. In fact, the more I read my Bible, the less I think I understand. I just trust him. I put my faith and my trust in his words. I have to trust him. That's what it's all about. That's what faith is about. I put my faith in him. Whatever he says, that's the way it is. It doesn't matter if I don't understand it. It doesn't matter if I don't think it's fair. That's not the issue. When children are born, they're not innocent. The Bible says we're born children of wrath. We're born children of the devil. To those who believe, I give the right to become children of God. You're not born a child of God. You become a child and you're adopted into God's family if you believe. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you put your faith in Jesus, you become a child of God. So up until that point, until you become a child of God, you are a child of the devil. Oh, yeah, but little kids, they can't make decisions. And they, and, 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 and. So the age, of, the age of 13, the age of accountability. I don't know who came up with the number 13. It's, it's not in the Bible. I've met children who gave their life to Jesus when they were seven. And they're born, and, and, and they continue to live a life following Jesus Christ from the time of seven. Tell me 13. And I'm not saying seven. I've met kids that are four. I have a grandson that's part genius. <laughs> when he gave his life to Jesus, you know, when he was just out of the womb, he just came out. <laughs> you know how they do that. Anyway, don't, don't put an age limit on it. A child is a, is a child of the devil until he becomes a child of God. So the little babies that die go to heaven. I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell me so. It doesn't tell me. I'm not going to make things up. Let's not make things up, okay? We try to make things so uncomfortable. Well, he was under 13, so it should be okay. We're born children of the devil. We're born with a sinful nature. That's why little children, little toddlers, are such good liars. They are. It's amazing. Who taught them? The way you identify the flesh, the sinful nature, is by its works. That's how you identify the sinful nature. What comes out of you is what's in your heart. If you're a follower of Jesus, then the fruit of the Spirit will come out of you. But if you're a follower of Satan, the fruit of the flesh will come out of you. That's, it's evident. That's what Paul's talking about here. So the first category of sins of, of immorality, it, it, Paul lists three sins. He says sexual immorality, impurity, and sensuality. We did sexual immorality already. If you missed it, it's online. It's censored, but it's online. Uh, last time we looked at sexual immorality. This time we're going to look at the second one, which is impurity. Impurity. And I don't know if you can figure this out, but impurity is the opposite of purity. Do you know that? So it's really quite simple. It's not a difficult one. But the word impurity, the one, the Greek word that's being used in this text, it, it comes from the medical term that refers to oozing. It's an oozing sore. It's an infected sore. Do you know that? Do you know what that's like? Let me make you all pass up. No, no. So when you're talking about somebody who's impure, you're talking about somebody that has sin just oozing out of them, like an infected soul. That's gross. Never thought of it that way before, impurity. So, so uh, the, here it's describing the unsaved man whose heart is infected and oozing with sin. Titus 1.15. Titus 1.15. To the pure... All things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled. Their minds and their consciences are defiled. Paul writes to the church in Rome in Romans 6, 19, and he says, I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity, and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, 
So now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification, which is holiness. As you once gave yourself, you know, I don't know about you, but when I when I do something, I, I, I'm, I'm all in. When I was a sinner, I was all in. People looked at me and they said, you are a good sinner. <laughs> I would do my best to sin as bad as I could. Now that I'm following Jesus, I'm going to do my best to follow Jesus. I'm going to do my best to be holy. Just as I presented my members as slaves to sin, I now present my members as slaves to righteousness. <clears throat> That's what we need to do. Impurity is what an unsaved person's life looks like. Impurity is the product of unclean flesh. It's a product of the sinful nature. W.E. Vine says this. He says this. Impurity denotes excess. Oh, oh, sorry. This is the sin of sensuality. I'm on the next one already. Holy smokes. Sorry, I'm, I'm jumping ahead. I'm too excited. The sin of sensuality. So we've done impurity, okay? Now the sin of sensuality. Go to the next slide. What was that? So this is W.E. Vine. He says this. Sensuality denotes excess, licentiousness, absence of restraint, indecency, and wantonness. That's what sensuality is. There are no restraints. There's no restraints to sensuality. There are many examples of sensuality in our day, especially since the 1960s. It seems that just when I was born, everything got started getting messed up, I guess, because I was in the world. <laughs> since that time, people have been more and more open about their sin, even proud of their sin. We started the, the whole hippie thing with, you know, free love and all that kind of promiscuous behavior and all kinds of shameful things. And we became more and more... Uh, um, the, the society accepted it more and more and, and now we're at a place where, where you can sin out on the street and everybody's good with it. Today people parade their sin shamelessly proclaiming their sin is a good thing. It's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. Today it's increasingly accepted in our society to be proud of our sin. It's even acceptable in educational circles and in entertainment and government. It's acceptable. My wife and I were, were trying to watch a movie, and the plot was excellent. The plot was just fantastic. It was a, it was a really well-written movie. But everybody is, is, is swearing, and it's not just like, it's not, it's not some of those words that you can handle. It's those words that you... That they're just over, over the top. Ruined a perfectly good movie. But it's what people seem to want to hear. And I don't understand it. I, I, I used to watch John Wayne movies uh, when I liked the army ones, like Green Beret. And, 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 and in those movies, you know, all those soldiers, they, they, they didn't swear. And, and I never, I never once, you know, and, and even when I was uh, a guy who swore all the time, and you cursing all the time. I never once watched one of those those John Wayne movies and said, "Oh, I wish they swore more." It would make it so much more real. I never did. I never missed the swearing in a movie. I don't know why we got to do it so much now, but we're proud of it. In fact, I, I bet a lot of people will watch a movie that's not restricted. You know, if there's no swearing, it's probably no good. It's called sensuality because it is pleasure that plays on our senses, which brings our sinful nature into action. That's why it's called sensuality. Barclay sees sensuality as an extreme form of immorality and evil. He writes this. It denotes sin so open and so blatant that it has ceased to have any regard for what anyone might think or feel or say. He says that it has three characteristics. It's wanton and undisciplined action. It is the action of a man who is at the mercy of his passions and his impulses and his emotions. It has respect neither for persons nor the rights of anyone else. Have you noticed that? People push their sin right in your face and they don't care what you think. 
It is violent, insolent, abusive, and audacious. It is completely indifferent to public opinion and to public decency. Wait, some sins that we were making legal in Canada that used to be illegal. Lifestyle choices. When, 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 when they became legal, the population of Canada said no. The majority of people said no. That's indecent. It's not right. But it still got passed because we don't care what public opinion says. It's my right to be sinful. It's my right to, to show my sin to everybody and, and push it in their face. He does openly and blatantly that which he did secretly and in concealment. Things that used to be done in, in secret are now done in public. Barclay describes it more fully, but more in a more helpful way. He says this. He says, here is the crux of the matter. The, the man in, his, in whose soul sensuality dwells is so much in the grip of sin, so much under its domination, that he does not care what people say or think so long as he can gratify his evil desires. He is the man who has no shame. There's actually a show I saw on Netflix. I didn't watch it, but it's called Shameless. Shameless. That's the way we live now. Most men have enough decency left to seek to hide their sin, but the person who is gripped with sensuality is long past that. He will be guilty of any outrageous conduct and care for nothing except to satisfy his desires. And, and that comes back to the, to, the, to the I generation, me. I have my rights. I can do whatever I want. Nobody can tell me what I can and cannot do. Look what Jesus says about sensuality. Mark 7, 21 to 23. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All of these evil things come from within and they defile a person. And Paul reminds us in our passage today that sensuality will keep us from the kingdom of God. Galatians 5.21, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and like, things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, Ephesians 4.19. They have become callous. They've given themselves up to sensuality. Greedy to practice every kind of impurity. They're greedy to practice every kind of impurity. It's this, the sensuality. Is this us? Is this the church? Do we have this problem? Do, do we want to practice every kind of impurity? Do you, do you ever feel that, that you missed out on something? Um, I've been a follower of Jesus since I was born, and, and I really wish that I had been sexually promiscuous, because I think I really missed out on a good time there. Do you ever get that feeling that maybe you missed out? Are, are we being punished somehow because we can't practice every kind of impurity? Look what Peter writes in 1 Peter 4, 2 to 3. So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. Is that how we live? For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. What those who are not followers of God want to do. Living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. In 2 Peter chapter 2, Peter warns of, of the false teachers aren't just teaching false stuff, they also they want the people to follow them in their sin. 2 Peter 2, 2, and many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. We've got a lot, of, a lot of leaders in the church, a lot of Christian people, celebrity people, who are teaching false stuff, and their lives are showing that they are living lives of sensuality, and they want everybody to follow it, to be like them. 
It's, it's crazy. And they're not ashamed. They're not ashamed. <coughs> we, need to, we need to think about this stuff seriously. And you know, when you read this, when I read this, I'm thinking, wow, these people are really, really under the domination of sin. These people who are involved in all the sensuality. Sensuality in our lives, it, it, it's like any sin. It's going to start just a little bit at a time. Maybe there's a little part of your life. But after a while, that gets worse and worse. And before you know it, you're dominated. Before you know it, you're, you're, you're seeking sensuality. We've got to ask ourselves, does sensuality dominate my life? Or does Jesus Christ dominate my life? You're not missing out on anything in life. <laughs> Our pastor who we used to have, he, he never tried alcohol in his life. He was, he was born again when he was seven years old. And he never tried alcohol in his life. And he says, you know what? He says, I look at my life and I think, I'm not missing anything at all. I'm not missing anything at all. In fact, he has something that a lot of us don't have. It, it's, it's a wonderful place to be when you haven't been involved in sensuality. Most of us have. Probably all of us have been involved in some kind of sensuality. We've been dominated. But now we're free from that. We don't want to go back. So make sure... Make sure that it's a clean break. Don't play with sensuality. Don't, don't, don't ever think, well, I, I just want to get involved in this kind of evil just a little bit because it looks good. That's obviously Satan's plan. Fellowship, let's all be people who are walking in the spirit, keeping step with the spirit, walking in fellowship with God. We're walking in the light, not in the darkness. We've been transferred from the darkness into his wonderful kingdom. Don't go back. Make sure your life is clean of sensuality. We don't live for the desires of the flesh, but rather we live for the will of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the way that you help us, the way that your Holy Spirit is always helping us to avoid the pitfalls of life to avoid sin, to avoid sensuality of any sort. We want to be a people who will inherit the kingdom of God. We don't want to be a foolish people who want to experiment with sin or get involved in sin, or even, even people, some of us already are living a lifestyle of sin, and, and, and we're proud of it. And somehow we, 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 we say we're, we're saying we're followers of Jesus, and yet we live this lifestyle, and we say, well, I'm allowed to because I'm free in Christ. Oh, God, that we would stop such foolishness. That we would, we would focus on trying to be more like Jesus Christ every day. So that when Jesus returns, <laughs> oh, he'd be so proud of us. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into my joy. I'll love to hear that. Father, for those of us who are struggling, we, we seem to be trapped in, in some sin. God, your word says that you've provided an escape, a way out. We're, we're not trapped. We're not trapped. The Holy Spirit will give us strength and courage. Oh God, I pray that we would lean on you, that we put our faith and trust in you, and that you would guide us out of these out of these messes that we've created. Oh God, that we would turn to you and we would stay faithful to you as you were faithful to us. Thank you so much. Give you all the praise and the glory. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
with faith and um, just learn how to put the armor of God so that we can just be strengthened and know how to fight this battle with the power of the Holy Spirit.